my name is Ben Sandowski, and as he said, uh, I work on the mobile team. And uh, probably the reason I'm here today is that uh, Twitter is probably one of the largest companies running Ruby in production today. And uh, to give you guys some scope of uh, how large uh, we are right now, we've got uh, about 110 million tweets coming in every day to the service. And because of the one-to-many uh, nature of the relationship of Twitter, there's some multiple of this number actually being delivered every day. Um, the record so far for uh, tweets per second is about 6,939 tweets per second. And it came in on New Year's of this year. They actually uh, overlaid, you can't really see it too well and, uh, because of the projector, but that's an overlay of a map of the world showing some of the epicenters on New Year's of uh, where the um, largest bursts of tweet were coming through. That's pretty cool. You can check it out on the blog. Um, now, as far as my team put things in scope there, about 40% of those tweets coming in every day are coming in through a mo uh, mobile origin. Now, it could be coming in through, uh, say, a native app like Twitter for iPhone. It could be coming in um, uh, through uh, the mobile website, mobile.twitter.com, or it could be coming in through our SMS service, which is huge, especially in countries where smartphones are large. So, Today, what I'm going to cover is uh, I'm going to go over the architecture uh, of Twitter in general so you can see where mobile fits into the big picture. And then we're going to show some case studies from the mobile team, just three areas where we're currently using Ruby, because uh, our team especially loves Ruby and uh, we use it whenever possible. Um, and they're pretty varying areas. Uh, and uh, of the three, we're probably going to dive into most detail on the mobile website, because I assume most of the people here are familiar with use, using Ruby and Rails for writing web apps, so you'll probably get the most of that. Uh, we'll wrap it up by showing some of the best practices that I think will be uh, co-opted from uh, Ruby early in the uh, development of the company. I think that Ruby was a major influence uh, in the uh, engineering best practices. And we have some time, hopefully, at the end to answer any questions people have. Cool. So um, let's just get started by showing exactly the architecture and where mobile fits in. So let's say you pop up your favorite client, and uh, you type hello world, and you hit tweet. It goes into this big chart, which uh, we're actually going to break down into three chunks. So initially, you load up your client, you hit tweet, and uh, it's sent to one of our front ends. Uh, if you're on twitter.com, to our web front end, which is running Rails, uh, or to uh, api.twitter.com if you're on a native app. Um, uh, which is also running a Rails front end, or if you're on mobile.twitter.com, that's actually a 100% pure API client. So it's actually routing itself on top of api.twitter.com, so it's just a, a nice layer of porcelain on it. So then, your tweet goes into the core code that handles all the uh, business rules. Who's following who, you know, uh, all the uh, lookups on the accounts, everything is uh, in one relatively large code base right now that's being split out into separate uh, service or, uh, a service-oriented architecture. And uh, right now, uh, we're still in the process of decoupling all the front-end code from the core code, but this is the eventual architecture that uh, we're striving toward. Um, and I won't go into detail about the services in this presentation that make up all the core code, but we have, for instance, our social graph service, which is powered by Flock, our open source uh, graph database. Our user service is sitting on MySQL. Um, we have a geo service, timelines. Uh, and if anyone's interested, you can find me afterwards. I'll be glad to talk in more detail there. Um, now, this part of the graph covers the request response cycle. So you hit tweet. Your tweet was routed to the main uh, code. And then we, uh, we verified that we actually wrote your tweet somewhere. It isn't actually delivered to users immediately. Uh, in the context of a request response, we just return you a 200. And really, we're dropping your tweet into a queue so that we can handle it using the asynchronous pipeline. And the reason here is mostly performance and scalability. Basically, we have a, a big queue full of tweets and a bunch of demons on the other side of this queue popping tweets off one at a time and doing with them uh, what they need to do. So for instance, in the example of uh, sending a tweet, we have the timeline demon, or the timeline fan out demon. So there's a demon there that's just popping tweets off the queue. It's making a lookup in our social graph to see, OK, who's following this user, and then it's delivering the tweet into all of those followers' timelines. Um, we have other demons, which we'll get into, like the SMS and push demon, which pops tweets off the queue and checks, OK, does this user have a device attached to his account, or, you know, uh, or is someone who is following this user, do they have a device attached to their account? Um, we also have the streaming API consumer. So if you're using the Firehose, it's popping tweets off and uh, fanning that out to Firehose consumers or user stream consumers. These are all just examples of three demons. We have tons of them doing all sorts of stuff. So, 
That's it in a nutshell. So I already touched a couple spots uh, where the mobile team plays a role, like at the very top, the mobile website, or uh, as I just showed a second ago, that SMS stuff. So, um, just a quick show of hands. Who here has ever had to like interoperate with an SMS carrier or a, an operator? Okay, and when I say that now, uh, how many people here actually have to connect directly to the carrier? So you're not actually using Twilio, you're not using a third party. Okay, uh, a smaller amount of people. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, which I would say the vast majority of people here, uh, it's uh, a lot of work to turn on uh, a carrier insofar as um, it isn't just uh, you point it to a phone and you, send it, uh, and you send a text message. We actually have to first strike deals uh, with each carrier uh, everywhere in the world. So in the US, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, but there's literally hundreds of carriers in the world. And for each of them, we have to set up first a business arrangement uh, saying, okay, here's what you can and can't do with users. Uh, and then we actually have to configure that carrier. So such as uh, each country or each carrier may have a different short code. In the US, it's just 40404, but it could be you know, whatever's available in that country. We have to internationalize all the commands, and we have to uh, also manage the disconnects file. So um, when you turn off your phone service uh, with your carrier, that carrier has to write down your phone number, and every so often they upload to us a list of phone numbers that are disconnected now and uh, no longer with their service, so we can purge them from our database uh, be uh, because they may not have shut off their Twitter account before closing down their account. And the reason they do that is um, down the line, so they may reallocate that phone number, and if you forget to turn off your Twitter account, <laughs> someone else is going to start getting your direct messages, which could be pretty awkward. So we have to arrange how do we get these phone numbers and start purging our DVD. Lots of, uh, lots of uh, stuff like that. Cool. So, um, as for the code base, um, it's actually divided into two parts. There's the web service portion, which is uh, getting incoming SMSs from the carriers and uh, um, handling all the business logic around it. And then there's the outgoing uh, code, which is actually a set of daemons that are calling out to the carriers um, in some cases using like a SOAP-like interface, some of them are using persistent connections. Again, it could be, you know, you name it, and some carrier is doing some completely different protocol for delivering SMSs to them. So um, the main code, uh, as I said, it handles a lot of product logic. We've, um, uh, in the case of uh, the daemons, uh, we're, some of the product logic, when we pop a tweet off the queue, saying this is supposed to go out to, uh, to a user, we check, okay, uh, is this device asleep? Uh, and you can actually set, I don't want to receive SMSs like from midnight to 6 a.m. so you don't, your phone doesn't ring. Or um, uh, there's any number of other configuration things that you have to perform at this layer before we push it off to the carrier. Uh, when we get an incoming SMS, we expose an endpoint so they can make a restful call just to post the incoming SMS message. And uh, incoming SMSs aren't necessarily just tweets. You can actually issue text commands like follow, uh, block and all those commands, so we have to have that layer on top of it and uh, know how to respond inside this app. Um, the app itself is a uh, Rails 2.3 uh, app right now. Uh, the logic is only about two and a half thousand lines of code, and it's actually a 1 to 1.5 uh, uh, code to test ratio, so there's actually more tests than there is code. So, um, what's an example though, um, going back, of some of the daemons that we uh, write to connect to these characters? Well, uh, for instance, when we wanted to turn on Apple push notifications, all we had to do is subclass our daemon base class and override the method and put all the logic in there. We pretty much refactored all of our uh, daemon code into one set of core classes that shared across the entire company. And the big advantage there is that our ops team now knows how to monitor and uh, spin up new instances of these daemons whenever we need to. So it's all pretty much just one code base that's shared among all of the Ruby-based daemons throughout the company. And as for the logic that's fit inside of that one method that you override in the subclass, uh, it's about 300 lines of code, which handles both calling out to Apple and receiving the disconnects from Apple when people uninstall the iPhone app. Uh, it also has a number of sanity checks. So um, in a large distributed system, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, among other things, uh, we've had situations where uh, plenty of duplicate SMSs have come in where uh, they expect to send out to users. So you might receive, let's say, like five SMSs from the same user, 
which, uh, you know, who knows what happened. Maybe a demon was turned off at the wrong time, but uh, when you're dealing literally with hundreds of demons spun up at once, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, so we have to put in sanity checks, uh, like to check against duplicates, because in the US you're charged per SMS you receive, and uh, lots of sanity checks like that. Uh, we also had to put in the payload formatting for Apple's uh, uh, payload that they expect from us, and we also do the auditing, so we can um, keep numbers on which carriers are receiving more SMSs lately. For instance, Cairo is pretty uh, big lately, and we can actually see in graphs, okay, what's going on there? It's pretty obvious. So that's the uh, SMS service in a nutshell. Cool. So actually, we're going to switch gears. And that last example was mostly about how we use uh, Ruby as a web service and how we're using daemons. This probably is more relevant to people, which is how we wrote a web front end using Rails uh, for the mobile website. So, uh, what's nice about the mobile website? Uh, I think it's a great example of an agile product. And uh, it was developed with two engineers, and it completed about 51 days from the first commit to the public preview. And uh, inside of those 51 days, we actually switched over the stack um, from the existing web apps that were uh, uh, running in Twitter to uh, um, which were previously running Mongrel, and we moved it over to Unicorn. This was actually the first Unicorn app that was running in production at Twitter. And then actually shortly before uh, production deployment, we switched over one more time to Rainbows because of uh, concurrency reasons we'll get to in a little bit. So uh, unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's nice to use something new and higher performance, but there's a lot of operational overhead, so you have to rewrite your public configs, you have to work with ops to see uh, uh, how they, if they can update their Mona configs and how do we handle when this uh, shiny new thing uh, runs into this weird situation you haven't run into before. So we had to pay the penalty and uh, you know, spend a week or so actually porting things over. Uh, also in the 51 days of developing the app, we had to develop a REST client from the ground up. And uh, we'll go into the details behind this client in a minute um, and why we didn't use existing clients out there and some of the design decisions. Uh, but in those 51 days, we did not sacrifice code quality. It's maintaining a one-to-one -one, uh, code-to-test ratio, or code, yeah, code-to-test ratio. And um, also, the big takeaway with this project is that we were developing a framework for connecting to the API. So I don't think that you uh, uh, need to be a really advanced Ruby hacker to get a lot of uh, out of Ruby, and it's more important to develop tools so that uh, more casual Ruby users can be really productive without having to understand the uh, details of the metaprogramming we'll get into. So actually, what do I mean by that? Um, so when we're developing our client, we wanted to develop a domain-specific language around connecting to the Twitter API. The goal being that uh, when API comes to us and says we have a new API endpoint, uh, we, it, it has this awesome, cool new feature, when can you ship this? Uh, we want to be able to spin up a new endpoint in an, a matter of minutes, describing how to connect to it and then, you know, put on all the uh, user logic. So here's an example of our uh, RESTful client making a call to the home timeline. And uh, current user is just an instance of the current user uh, based on their cookie. And we're making an API call there to fetch their home timeline. It's pretty uh, straightforward. This method is generated dynamically by making this call inside uh, the class it will uh, generate the finder. And uh, this is an example of the domain-specific language we created, where it was saying, okay, wire to this API path, the home timeline uh, API path, uh, connect to that endpoint, you're gonna take the JSON that you get back from the endpoint, and you're gonna map it to the tweet class. And the name of the method is gonna be find home timeline, so it's as home timeline, and collection equals true means this is actually an array of objects, it's not just one instance of an object. And uh, you're not going to be quizzed on this, uh, but it's really easy to, uh, even now, just glancing at, it, at it, glancing at it, it makes a lot of sense exactly what it's doing. And, you know, if you spend five minutes learning this domain-specific language, you can quickly define your whole API in about one page. And this is cutting back down hundreds, maybe thousands of lines of boilerplate code. And the less copy and pasting you have to do, the less chance you're going to make an error. So this is describing the entire uh, API that we're connecting to. Um, this only describes, though, uh, half the challenge, which is actually connecting to the endpoint. How do we now map the JSON that we get back from API to uh, 
to friendly user or friendly Ruby objects, right? So you have business logic wrapped inside of there. Well, the solution is a domain-specific language. And here uh, we wrote an ob uh, objectification module, which also allows us to have access to a lot of um, uh, class methods to describe how we're mapping keys inside the JSON back onto attributes on top of the Ruby object. So here we're saying uh, in exposes, uh, we're going to list off a bunch of attributes that we want accessors of, uh, uh, built into the object around the hash keys. Um, and below that, we can also define custom behavior for certain hash keys. So for instance, if uh, people here aren't familiar with the Twitter API, um, we return for tweets a tweet object, and embedded inside of that object is a subhash that describes the user. So here, uh, under that objectifies line, we say take the user uh, key and take that hash and pass it to the user class, which will turn be objectified with a similar DSL like this inside that class. We can also pass custom parsing, uh, so in the example of created at as a hash key, uh, we just want to take the value we get back and we pass a lambda to say, all right, now uh, parse that using time.parse. So it's pretty flexible. No matter what API throws at it, uh, we can pretty succinctly describe how we should parse it and turn it into a real object. So, cool. And here's a, a, a fun topic. Uh, at least a couple years ago, I remember a lot of people were asking about this. I don't know if it's still big in the Ruby community, uh, scaling. Uh, it's actually not that difficult, I think, for uh, CPU-bound operations in Ruby to go after a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, one example would be doing research about the libraries that you're using. And I'm surprised by uh, the number of people who use the JSON C library when uh, the Yagile C library for parsing JSON is literally an order of magnitude faster in the benchmarks we were performing. And they actually have uh, backward compatibility with the existing JSON gem. So literally dropping in two lines into your code will give you JSON parsing an order of magnitude faster than when you had before. Um, again, it, it, just doing research and looking to see what other libraries are out there that may be more suited for what you need to accomplish. Uh, on the mobile website, um, because we can't use recaptcha for our sign-up captures, we have to generate our own captures for scr from scratch for low-end devices. And uh, I think everyone, hopefully at one time or another, has run into uh, manipulating images on Ruby, and uh, maybe they've used uh, our magic or uh, other libraries. And um, I'm surprised by how few people have actually seen GD2. And this is a cool uh, image library. It was actually extracted from PHP, and it's now, um, there's wrappers available for pretty much all major languages. And uh, it's at least twice as fast as far as generating images compared to uh, image magic, or at least scaling images. And uh, we haven't run into any kind of memory leaks or any of the other problems that um, in the past our magic has been uh, afflicted with. And uh, we actually wrote a very simple wrapper around it so that um, you don't have to worry too much about memory allocation. It's mostly abstracted away from you. And uh, again, this was only like a project that took a couple days to uh, throw together uh, for image, uh, the image generation portion. So uh, one other way that you can watch CPU on your front ends is actually being aware of object allocations. And uh, there's a misconception that I keep hearing over and over again that because you are using a garbage collector, you don't have to worry about memory management. That's all handled for you. And uh, it, you know, face palm. Uh, it's, it, yeah, talking to a really talented engineer from Google, uh, I asked him, well, you know, what about these systems like in Java that have a garbage collector? I mean, can you really tolerate garbage collection pauses when you're talking about the super high scale systems? And he said, well, actually, yeah. Uh, the thing is, Java programmers realize that there's memory management uh, still involved, and they're still just as uh, conservative about uh, allocating objects and how we're reusing objects and you're still working, understanding when you're allocating uh, frame objects, it's just you aren't doing it by hand. And I think that um, you don't have to go in there and really drill in deep to see where am I allocating objects, but you just have to approach it from the mind, am I being conservative with uh, generating a lot of temporary strings? You know, what's the difference between saying string plus string versus embedding one string in the other? How many temporary strings are you generating? Things like that. As long as you're mindful of it, I think there's huge gains. But, um, we talked a lot about uh, front-end CPU, but I think that uh, it's kind of a red herring when you're writing a web app. 
Um, I think that the first way that you can scale your app is being aware of concurrency and where you're actually spending your time in requests. So let's say you've optimized your app so that you can parse JSON and uh, perform all your business logic and spit back a render template in 10 milliseconds. That's awesome. What if you're spending 100 milliseconds waiting on API or you're waiting for your database? And in that 100 milliseconds, you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs doing nothing. So the end user, uh, that's 100 milliseconds wasted. Your server is going to reach capacity even though it's not actually peaked in CPU. Um, it's important to actually look, go into your app and see, well, how is most of my request time being spent? And it turns out, uh, in the app, when we were looking at it, most of our time was I.O. bound. Depending on the load to the API, uh, we could see uh, load times that were over 100 milliseconds um, and even worse. And it's amazing how much you can accomplish in 100 milliseconds. I mean, if you could just batch up your requests and you could accomplish 10 requests in that 100 milliseconds while you're mostly twiddling your thumbs, you now have 10 times more capacity. That's hand-wavy math. Uh, <laughs> So uh, Ruby, unfortunately, uh, um, has, I don't know, there's a, a lot of people have complained about its concurrency model. Um, there's a great, great, great article, uh, Concurrency in Ruby uh, is a Myth. You should all Google it, where it talks about fun things like the global interpreter lock. So when you're calling out to C code, your threads pause, and lots of fun things like that. And I won't go into too much detail, but we researched different solutions, and we settled on, uh, for connecting to our API, we're using a library called Typus. And uh, among other things that this library gives us for making RESTful requests, uh, one, it's a libcurl binding, so it's very performant. Specifically, it's a libcurl multi-binding. And especially interesting is that it respects the global interpreter lock, and it will not pause all of your green threads while it's waiting on responses from API. So what we ended up settling on is we built our RESTful client around Typus, and uh, then we turned on multi-threading mode in Rails, and uh, we switched over to Rainbows, and we're using green threads. So, um, one caveat is that uh, it's very difficult to work with concurrency in general. Uh, there's different paradigms, uh, you know, event-driven programming. Uh, there's functional programming. Uh, there's uh, different ways of thinking about um, handling concurrency, and in the interest of keeping things simple, especially for developers who are used to more uh, synchronous programming, we wrote, again, a very simple, um, I don't even know, even know if you call it a domain-specific language around issuing concurrent requests. And here's an example, where basically, when we issue each of these finds, we're not blocking. We're actually returning a proxy object. And it's not until we uh, call the fire request method that we drop down to Typus, batch those three REST calls into one libcurl multi-call, and we suspend the current thread in Rails. And while it's suspended, other threads are still running and uh, receiving uh, calls from uh, incoming requests. So, and then when this resumes, those three objects will be filled in the actual responses from API. And this is actually a pretty simple way of uh, thinking about concurrency rather than throwing lots of lambdas everywhere and worrying about syncing and all that sort of thing. Cool. All right, switching gears one more time uh, to probably the least conventional way that we're using uh, Ruby on the mobile team is as a uh, testing harness. And um, I don't know if anyone here has ever tried automated testing on uh, Coco or uh, on iPhone because it's, I don't think it's nearly uh, as mature as uh, the Ruby testing community. I mean, there's uh, so many great frameworks available and great tools, and um, you know, one solution would be port a bunch of these tools over to Coco, you know, that'd be cool, um, or be really lazy and just run Ruby. And uh, it turns out that the core code that's uh, running on the iPhone, iPad app, and the Mac app is actually just vanilla Coco. It's just uh, straight up regular Objective-C, and it's not dependent on uh, iOS frameworks for all the core business logic, like. How do we handle user accounts? How do we tweet? That sort of thing. And just so happens that MacRuby plays very well with Coco. Uh, and it has a nice one-to-one -one mapping, so you can treat Coco objects just like Ruby objects. And matter of fact, in the latest version of uh, MacRuby, they even have built-in uh, support for, uh, I believe it uses Minitest. 
So it was pretty easy to develop a test suite and treat uh, these Cocoa objects just as regular old Ruby objects and slap on a uh, simple UI using interface builder. It only took about an afternoon and we're working to actually integrate this inside of a continuous integration. So whenever we uh, push a new um, update through Git, it'll automatically run on the continuous integration server and you know, everything you expect. Cool. So, part three. Uh, the best thing I've heard about uh, company culture is that it's like cement. And that uh, while the cement's wet, it's very easy to sculpt and change, but as soon as the cement's dry, uh, it's not going anywhere. And uh, the way I interpreted it, that was about general company culture, but the way I also interpreted it is about engineering. And uh, we were very lucky. Uh, the company early on had uh, very enthusiastic Ruby developers, and with the Ruby community, uh, had a very strong culture of certain best practices, such as automated testing and agile methodology. Um, and also with the help of uh, Pivotal Labs, they drove home a lot of the Agile techniques. And I think that um, a lot of the philosophies of Ruby are more important than the language itself. I think one of the great things about Ruby is the community, and we're all here to get stuff done, and we care a lot about the product, and I think that's influenced our team. So this is just an example again from the mobile team. Each team might be different, but uh, we believe in having small Agile teams, almost like a startup. And uh, on our particular team, we have one product manager, uh, one designer, and three developers, all working on the iPhone and iPad apps. And uh, having worked at different companies uh, which have you know, a massive scale of users, I've never been on such a small team that's had such a large reach for the app that they're working on. It's really exciting, but uh, I'm especially excited that we understand you, know, you don't throw people at a problem. Um, also, uh, it encourages uh, communication when you're in that small of a group. I can just Turn, my, turn over to the guy sitting next to me, ask him a question. It's very easy to communicate among our small team. Um, we also practice iterative development. So in this team, uh, every week, we have an iteration planning meeting. And uh, with the help of Pivotal Tracker, how many people here use Pivotal Tracker? OK, you're all awesome. And if you <laughs> aren't using it, you go try an account right now. I think it's still free, but it's totally worth every penny. It's a great agile tool. And using Pivotal Tracker, we write out the user stories. And uh, uh, these are the features that we want to accomplish this week. Or we write out the bugs that we want to fix. And then we can score them, drag and drop them. Uh, this is probably boring for people who already use Tracker. But uh, based on how we score these stories, the release will uh, move uh, based on the points that are uh, left. So we're always fluctuating the release date, and we aren't trying some rigid waterfall approach. And uh, it's really exciting. So. One last part about Agile uh, development is that we believe in uh, continuously shipping code. Uh, on the website, uh, on twitter.com and on the mobile site, we are deploying every day. On twitter.com desktop, actually there's an average of three deploys every day. Uh, I think the record has been about seven deploys in one day. And uh, inside each of those deploys, are between 10 and 30 feature branches going out. So um, this requires a lot of process for this to work. For instance, our rigorous test suite, which uh, alone would take an hour to run if you were to try to run our test suite, but we have it parallelized, so it takes about two minutes because it's going to a fleet of uh, testing machines. Um, we have a number of processes in place around uh, um, releasing products. We canary deploys, so they only go to a subset of the servers, and we monitor metrics before we spread them out to the whole fleet. But uh, we have a lot of processes in place that uh, ensure that um, we don't run into any problems with this. But we believe it's all totally worth it to be able to write a feature in the morning, get a code review, and then ship it that afternoon. That's really exciting. So, cool. Um, actually, uh, Native clients are a little more difficult for continuous uh, deployment because of the nature of the beast. Uh, one compromise we've had is that actually we do weekly releases internally to employees. Um, it's nice on the iPhone, if you have an enterprise account, you can do over-the-air updates. So every week now, after iteration planning, we say, all right, let's cut that release, and we uh, make a build, and we push it out to employees on their iPhone so that we're constantly getting feedback. Cool. So. Hopefully, if I've done my job, you're really excited about the company, you're wondering how you can work there. Uh, and actually, to segue though, um, honestly, one of the most important things about your engineering organization is who you have on your team. 
And uh, in our mobile team, we care about a few things. I don't think it's worth a bullet point, but we obviously care about people who technically know what they're doing. But uh, you know, beyond that, we care about people who are passionate about the product. And you can tell when someone uses the product every day and they really get it and what we're trying to do. And uh, we really like those people. We watch for open source contributors. If you have GitHub on your resume, you've got your foot in the door. Uh, we love seeing open source. And even if you don't do open source, in a similar vein, if you're working on personal projects. If you've got a really cool startup and you're just trying out to see where it goes, doing a cool weekend project, if we see that, that's a big flag that this person probably is passionate about what they do. And uh, finally, um, I think that this is the first company where I've uh, been at where uh, culture is one of the, the major uh, points people try to dra drive home when they're hiring. Um, we will gladly turn away an applicant who is outstanding technically, but it's clear that, that uh, they wouldn't click with the team. We care very much about being surrounded by people who, again, are passionate about the product and really excited to work with, but just in general, people you'd want to hang around with, uh, that you like being around, and are positive and a lot of fun. So. Cool. So actually that is all the stuff I wanted to cover so that we could uh, leave some time at the end to answer any kind of questions you will have. Yep. I have a question about what I believe is a known bug on the mobile site. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just say that I haven't touched the mobile site in seven months. I'm now all working on the iPhone, so. Uh, this has been around for about seven months. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll help see if it's actually being worked on. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, do you guys do full stack mobile dev uh, <laughs> on your team? Uh, what do you mean? Okay, uh, do uh, we do like full stack? Interface versus uh, core data or things like that. Or what was the first part? What you said? Sorry, interface builder versus core data or anything like okay, that. Okay, so um, do we do full stack mobile development? Do we use interface builder? Do we use core data? Is that the question? Uh, sorry. Uh, do you split your team up into separate oh. sub parts, or does oh, know, is a person a is a person a specialist in one yeah. particular area? Yeah. Um, so, in particular, on the iPhone app, uh, and actually, this is true of all of I think our, our developers. We believe in generalists. So, in fact, as I said, um, until seven months ago, I was working on the mobile website, and then they switched me over to the iPhone. And uh, we actually have another developer who's working on the mobile site who's going to be working on Android. So um, I believe uh, we certainly want to avoid the bus danger where one guy gets hit by a bus and they contain all that knowledge and we're kind of screwed. So um, in general, we try to rotate people around. Uh, and I think that we all have at least some knowledge of the different areas. But for instance, um, uh, I've been lately working on uh, a feature that involves using SQLite. And because I come from a web development background, I'm able to write SQL pretty well. So they're like, all right, why don't you work on that? Um, one thing that we didn't cover is, uh, and this goes into the generalist um, aspect, is that in order to ship features, we believe in code reviews. So before you can merge your code into the main code base, you have to upload a diff to a, a review board, and a teammate has to write ship it on it. And part of it is also that, well, part of it so that you get two eyes on the same code, so you aren't making an obvious mistake. But indirectly, it's educating other people on what's going on in the code, so they kind of have to know what's going on in order to give you a ship it. Hopefully. With respect to code reviews and the, your significant testing setup, how do you deal with the taxation involved in okay. time? So in, your question is, in, in relation to all the process, code reviews and testing, uh, how do we deal with taxation and time? And I think that, uh, one, it's dependent on the team. So some teams are more rigorous about unit testing than others. Um, so we, to a degree, leave it a little to the discretion of the team. As a company, we strongly encourage unit testing. But I think that what's important is that all of these uh, best practices have tools built around them so there's minimal taxation. So actually, uh, when we are ready to push code to the main uh, repository to touch twitter.com desktop, uh, we have a, a script called make review. And it's an actual, it'll prompt you each step. And it will, uh, once you've uh, finished each step, it will upload your diff. 
It'll create a, a, a ticket in JIRA for you. Um, and it'll automatically, I think it'll actually CC your entire team for the code review, and it'll do absolutely everything except for clicking the publish button to actually send out the email. So I think that the important thing is one, develop, uh, just building all the tools around the process. Otherwise, you know, unless you can ingrain the habit, people aren't going to do it. And you know, make it easy for everyone. I think is the key thing. How do you manage to get the test week to finish in two minutes as opposed okay. to one hour? Right, so uh, I didn't go into too much detail. Um, we built a system uh, that it parallelizes the test suite, so it'll divide it among a number of uh, servers uh, uh, in our fleet. So it'll evenly divide it, so instead of whatever, one server, it's 10 servers. Uh, the math there doesn't work out, I'm just using numbers. Uh, but it parallelizes the suite, and it has its own interesting set of uh, challenges because, you know, your certain tests, uh, if you aren't careful, your test suite may not uh, be optimized to be touching the same resource. <laughs> You could be clobbering over each other, and so um, our internal uh, release team focused on working off all the details. And then, when you want to run this automated test suite, there's a utility in our bin directory that's uh, called Swoop. We say Swoop test, and it'll give you a nice progress bar. And two minutes later, it'll tell you if there are any uh, errors. So, uh, I'll go you first. You talked about having uh, small agile teams. Yep. Do you do pair programming and they stand up? Okay. Um, in our small, uh, I mentioned small agile teams, do we do pair programming or do we do stand-ups? And uh, um, we practice uh, company-wide little a agile. Um, on a per team basis, some of them are much more into pair programming than others. Uh, on the mobile team, for a long time, we were doing pair programming. And uh, lately, we haven't been doing it as much. Um, uh, you know, shame on us. Uh, but uh, on other teams, they still embrace pair programming, and it really works out for them. So it's really at the discretion of the team, and we highly encourage it. Um, yeah, so it's a team-by-team -team thing. Uh, uh, uh. All right, we'll start again. How do you uh, do authorization for mobile clients? Authorization, uh, how do we do authorization for mobile clients? Um, what authorization do you mean? Like they use like OAuth or XR? Um, we're actually, uh, so on mobile.twitter.com, how do we use, do authorization? So you hop on the mobile site, how do we authorize you? Again, we're playing by the same rules as everyone else, and we're using XAuth. And it was interesting, um, uh, when we first launched the app, um, we weren't using XAuth, and it ended up being a lot more trouble than what it was worth uh, to try to use like some internal system. So we just ended up moving everyone over to XAuth so that it was one, one pipeline with the same team working on it on the API end. What's XAuth? <laughs> um, so XAuth is uh, OAuth. Hopefully everyone's played with OAuth, which is you click a link saying log me to the site, and they give you a pop-up, and you have to click a link there, and it redirects you back to the site. XAuth allows uh, the provider or the uh, or the third party app to just give a username and password input, which then makes a call to our API and returns the OAuth token. And the use case for that, especially on native clients like the iPhone, is it can seem a little weird to pop up a web view and then putting your username and password there and the web view disappears. And also on really, really low end devices like feature phones, like you wouldn't believe, like have like 512K memory, it can't pop up a web view. So, in certain situations, but it requires special uh, uh, privilege you'd have to talk to API about. Uh, yes? What is the breakup of the users between mobile.twitter.com and uh, the native app? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. Sorry. Uh, well, what's the breakup of uh, users on the mobile website to the native app? Sorry. <coughs> do you do manual QA and how does that fit into with your continuous shipping strategy? Uh, do we do manual QA, and how does that fit into our continuous shipping strategy? No. We don't do any, uh, we, insofar as we don't have a team of people clicking on buttons to uh, uh, make sure us. that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, however, um, what we try to do though is instead of all the employees, for starters, you own your product, and there's a danger if you do have a QA team is that you can fall into the pattern of, all right, I'll just throw this over the wall and let them handle it. Um, so, especially on the iPhone app, there's a certain level of ownership among all the people on the team, where uh, at all times, for instance, we're running the latest current build, so as soon as we run into a bug, we're fixing it, and we're expected to do all the responsible uh, QA ourselves, hopefully build automated testing systems around it so it doesn't become so repetitive. And then we have a roll-up strategy of rolling out to all the employees in the company, and we give them tools to report bugs, and then um, we also have a system uh, called uh, Decider, so when we're rolling out a new feature in production, we may roll it up to zero users, and then uh, roll it up to 1% of users. 
which in part is to see how does this affect system stability and uh, also, you know, it, is there an issue in general with users using this feature? So we believe very much in slow, deliberate rollout of features and uh, also personally taking um, charge of QA and having personal accountability around the code you write. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that you have a lot of tools built around uh, helping your process not take up a lot of your time. One thing that I know with a lot of agile processes is making sure that you are able to adapt your process efficiently to changing needs, changing demands, uh, <coughs> team members, whatever can really influence how your team interacts. How do you ensure that these tools uh, don't block you into a process that make you less efficient? And okay. how do you allow them? Okay, so the question is how do we make sure that the tools, if I understand, aren't having too much control on how we do things, like uh, we're not being locked into one regimen based on the tools, is that right? Okay, and I think that again it goes back to each team has a, a certain uh, level of leeway as to how they get things done. So actually the mobile team is one of the uh, most uh, evangelical people to use uh, Pivotal Tracker, and we use it for all of our uh, iteration planning. However, for actual ticket management, uh, we use JIRA when we're actually pushing things out to production so that there's that level of accountability and tracking. So everything up until we create the JIRA ticket, it's up to us. We just make sure we have a JIRA ticket so everyone can sync together. And I think that um, part of uh, empowering people is giving them that flexibility to do things however best works for them, and the results speak for yourself. That said, uh, company-wide, we're trying to get slightly more regimented like, and moving toward um, you know, the mature development style like at a Google, where we're trying to push toward new things that people might not be as familiar with, especially from a startup environment. For instance, uh, we've been active, especially in the last year, on encouraging <coughs> uh, design reviews on major new features. So you get feedback from your peers before you even lie down your first line of code. It's probably overkill if you're making a copy change on uh, the website, but if you're developing a new feature, it really is a huge advantage to just spend a lunch, uh, lunch with your peers and show people what you're working on. Um, there's a cell phone, I think. Uh, but we, uh, so we're trying to push people toward newer processes they might not be familiar with, and uh, there's a little degree of uh, regimen there, but it's, it's a balancing act. Yep. You guys, you guys use the iPhone UI on Uh, we've uh, looked at it, but we haven't invested, uh, or the question is, are we using the iPhone UI integration testing toolkit? And uh, I think that was relatively recently released, and I saw uh, some info about it, but we haven't yet invested time to fully build up end-to-end -end testing on the iPhone, but eventually we're gonna do it. Okay, so I think, um, I think we'll just uh, wrap things up right now, and uh, if anyone has any questions, please find me, I'll be happy to answer them. I'd like to actually thank uh, JR and Kobe and everyone behind this uh, event. It's been really exciting. Thank you for having me.